Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi, Courtney. Hi, Rick. Thanks for joining. We're going to give it a few more minutes while folks join us, but we're happy to have you here for today's cafe. Workforce Development Consultation and the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Thanks for joining us. Um, folks are, are still coming in, but feel free to um, make yourself comfortable. You can put your name in the chat. I'm Laura Riley. I'm the coordinator of Chicago Wilderness Alliance. And I want to welcome Sarah Vasca from Blue Stem Ecological Services here to uh, be our presenter today. Thanks so much, Laura. And yeah, we're going to do some uh, more introductions um, once we get started with the presentation. Um, but yeah, my name is Sarah Vasca, and she, her pronouns. Um, I work for Blue Stem Ecological Services. We're a native landscaping company out of McHenry County, Illinois, um, and I'm their sales manager. I've worked here for five years, and I'm just like so lucky. I feel like I've got my dream job into work in ecosystem restoration. Um, I'm also a uh, member of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration's Youth Task Force. So we'll hear a little bit more about what is the UN Decade, um, you know, what is the Youth Task Force and all that in just a little bit. Uh, but um, kind of the short and sweet of it is there's 25 members who were nominated to a two-year term of this Youth Task Force, which is kind of an official mandate under the UN Decade um, process. They have five different task forces. And youth is kind of the only like affinity group one. There's one on science, there's one on monitoring, um, but youth is uh, the only like kind of personnel or like kind of uh, affinity group that is represented. So we're really fortunate to have that opportunity. Um, there's about 25 of us on the um, task force and I'm the only one from the United States. So really fortunate to have this opportunity to uh, bring together and, and kind of listen to the voices of youth from across the United States and carry those forward into um, how the UN Decade operates, but also soliciting feedback from other practitioners in the region, um, other people who are working in ecosystem restoration, conservation fields, making sure that um, everyone has a voice and can kind of connect the work that um, we're doing on the ground with these global goals. So we'll be talking a little bit about how we're kind of scaling it up. Um, I just think it's so exciting being in the Chicago region. We have such a wealth of knowledge, such a, a well-developed programming and, and organizations and networks of ecosystem restoration. There's practitioners who've been doing this for 50, 70 years. Um, that is not something that um, is happening globally necessarily, um, or even in other Parts of the United States. So we're really at a, a really uh, crucial um, kind of uh, point in, in where we are and in using the Chicago region as a model to scale up restoration across the world. Thanks everyone who's been uh, introducing themselves in the chat. Thanks so much. All right, I, I wanna say a quick quick thank you to our sponsors. I wanna thank the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, Urban and Community Forestry Program and the US Forest Service for the support for this cafe and others. 
um, this funding supports the training so that they can improve the urban tree canopy across the United States through the Tree City USA program and many other ways. So thank you for that. And whenever you're Hello? ready. Ready for me to get started? Yes. All right. So again, my name is Sarah Vasca. I use she, her pronouns, and I work for Blue Stem Ecological Services. And I'm also a member of the Youth Task Force of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Um, so we're going to be talking today about, base, um, basically the goal of today is for me not to talk the whole time, but for you all to, um, you know, I know we've got kind of a longer session today. It's about two, two and a half hours. And so wanting to make sure that there's opportunities for each of you to share your knowledge, your experiences, um, you know, what you've learned from the time that each of you spent in the field. I mean, we have, you know, probably a couple hundred years of collective knowledge um, in this group um, that's on the call today of experiences in ecosystem restoration fields. And so let's bring all those voices together. We're going to be using the results of this, um, of this conversation today to um, kind of, this, this consultation is gonna be repeated um, in other areas of the world um, with the same questions, different audiences, as we work to gather voices um, on what does ecosystem restoration look like and what opportunities exist for workforce development, for green jobs, specifically for young people. And when we talk about young people today, just kind of as a point of clarity, we're typically referring to um, you know, the, when I say youth, it's under 35 years old. So in the US, typically we call that like young professionals. Um, so it's kind of that 18 to 35 range is really kind of the crux of what we're referring to. So if you are under 35 and you're like, I'm a youth still, this is great. Um, good for you, this is exciting, right? Um, but um, that's based on kind of the broadest possible um, definition of youth within the UN system, which is from the African Union, which defines youth up to 35. Others will say up to like 21 or or 25, you know, kind of varies um, where that definition is. But um, for today, we'll be doing kind of that 18 to 35 range. And so when you think about that age range, you're thinking, you know, you're, um, you just graduated from high school, maybe you're in college or community college, um, maybe you're in a, you know, a different trade school or, or doing internships and things like that. Maybe you're starting your career and just kind of kicking off, or maybe you're, you know, maybe five to 10 years in by the time you're 35 years old, maybe you're a couple of years into your career and looking to move up into higher positions, maybe a management position. And how do we, um, you know, how do each of those um, transformations in your career pathway and and your kind of vocational journey, how do those um, impact uh, the, what opportunities are there? So those are kind of the things we kind of are wanting to think about as we frame this discussion. Um, so we've got quite an agenda today. So we're gonna start with some introductions and then we're going to move into um, a kind of an understanding of what is the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. You know, there's, there's a lot of terms um, some of them you'll be like, I never need to know this again. Other ones, it will, you know, it'll be helpful to have a of what are the different things that we're talking about. But for the most part, the consultation doesn't require prior knowledge other than your own lived experiences. Okay. Um, so don't feel too intimidated by that. Then we're going to move into some breakout rooms. And we're going to have three different sessions where we um, are going to have you in a small group of, you know, three to five people maybe. Um, and then we're going to share some questions and you're going, we're going to use this new feature of, there's a whiteboard feature on Zoom now. And so we're testing that out. So there might be some hiccups, but each group will have a page of the whiteboard that you'll work off of. And we'll use that as a way of aggregating all of your inputs and making sure everyone's voices can be heard, whether you're sharing, you know, talking or, or you're writing things down, just depend on what your comfort level is. And then that whiteboard is going to be what I use to take all the notes together and put into, you know, what did the Chicagoland region say are the barriers to youth engagement or, or the job opportunities available in ecosystem restoration, okay? So we're going to have these breakout rooms. We're going to come back between each breakout room so that uh, we can share. Each group can say one or two things that really stood out to them. And then we'll go back in for the next session. And then um, I think we're going to probably skip the outcome document or I'll just kind of 
summarize, you know, how we're going to use this data and then how you can get involved if you or a young person you know wants to um, engage more in the UN decade system. Any questions on that on the agenda? All right, then we'll jump right in. Um, so first we're gonna start with some introductions and you can do this in the chat if anyone else wants to kind of speak up and you know you can raise their hand or unmute yourself to do your introduction, you're welcome to do that too. We've got a nice cozy group, but it's just helpful because some of these questions do have, you know, some vulnerability, um, you know, talking about, you know, what it's been like in your career with a chronic illness or with, you know, some sort of disabling condition, whether it's, you know, a torn ACL that you're like, oh, can I, you know, do I tell my employer that I just tore my ACL a month before the start of the season? Or do I not tell them so that they actually hire me and give me hours that I need? You know, things like that. Um, you know, there's going to be some vulnerable moments as we address, you know, some of the systemic inequalities and barriers that people face um, when entering this workforce. And so just having kind of an understanding of where each of us are coming from is really helpful. Um, if you're not comfortable for any reason sharing, you know, these affinity groups, this is all just, you know, self-identifying. So share what you're comfortable with, um, but encouraging each of you to, you know, kind of bring us together as friends and and uh, coming together as a, a network of people who care about this work really deeply. Um, so I'll kind of give an example. Um, so my name is Sarah Bosco. I work for Blue Stem Ecological Services, and I also am part of the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and the affinity groups that I belong to are I'm a youth. I, am, I work in the private sector um, as a land manager um, and a restoration ecologist. I'm a woman and uh, you know, work in the green sector. I also have a, a chronic illness. I have long COVID. And so um, sometimes I feel like I might, you know, be kind of on that crux of disabled person as well. So depend, you know, sometimes just depending on the day of how I feel. Does anyone else want to share out loud or in the chat? Um, I encourage all of you to, to do this. Um, the reason we ask these questions and ask you to introduce yourself is so that we can just kind of keep track of what voices are we including in these conversations so that we can make sure that we are having a representative um, group that's participating in these conversations. Oh, I see Courtney raised your hand. Do you wanna go? Sure, I'll go. Uh, my name is Courtney Grieve. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I am an educator. Uh, so I teach for Gateway Technical College in Kenosha on both Kenosha and our Elkhorn campuses. Um, I am a woman um, and um, I'm also a military veteran and I'm a community leader as well, um, being engaged in both uh, uh, my local American Legion and VFW posts. Thanks so much. Sarah Anderson. Hello, my name is Sarah Anderson. I use she, her pronouns. I'm an environmental educator that's passionate about impact at the intersection of social and environmental justice. I am a mother, a white woman, and um, I really appreciate being part of these communities to learn from the knowledge and experience of others. Thanks. Thank you. Winton, thanks so much for introducing yourself in the chat and sharing a little bit about yourself. Tim, did I see you raise your hand? Yeah, uh, Tim Brennan, okay. Vice, President, Vice President of External Relations with Farm Foundation. I'm one of the team leaders on our Growing with Ag uh, at the Chicago Wilderness Alliance. Um, I'm gonna go through this list here. It's a community leader in a variety of ways, educator. We are a, a nonprofit 501c3 uh, landowner. I live on a small farm about 35 miles south of Chicago. Um, LGBTQ, anything else? I think that's it. Awesome, thanks so much. Rick? Hi, I'm Rick Croja. Um, Try to describe myself as kind of difficult other than I work for a lot of different park districts over the years. Um, I'm on my seventh park district now, generally a master horticulturist. I've been studying plants since I was, well, since I could steal clippings from Jewel and propagate them in my, 
bedroom at about the age of nine. So um, from there, it was just off and running with horticulture. So I've dabbled in just about every piece of the industry, but parks has been the area where I've been able to make the largest contribution and impact um, where trees are truly my greatest passion. And um, so in 2017, I established the first level two accredited Arboretum through the Morton Arboretum's ArbNet program up in Vernon Hills. And since then have grown that collection, collection is just shy of 200 different varieties at that one park. But now I've moved on to Hoffman Estates to help them with their um, Arboretum. But basically I plant for diversification. I rarely plant the same trees twice. Um, I'm still now just trying to go around taking photographs and figure out what I've actually planted over the past 10 years, but I'm approaching about a thousand trees that I've selected and dropped into the ground at various, uh, three different living collections across three different park districts. So I hire a lot of these young people. I teach them out in the field, how to do different forms of land management. And then I watch them go on in their careers. Either they go land management and park system, or they go off into what they originally planned to. So. That's uh, about, I'm a father, I'm a man, I'm a father of two teenage daughters, and two years ago, I quit my full-time job at the Vernon Hills to be a stay-at-home dad, and I work part-time for Hoffman Estates to keep myself busy in the line of work that I love. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rick. Patty? Um, yeah, I'm Patty Vitt. I... Um... I guess I'm a land owner and manager uh, for the Lake County Forest Preserve District. So I'm a municipal government representative. Um, I am a woman. I do research. Um, I would call myself a community leader. I'm one of the leads on the Chicago Wilderness um, Healthy Landscapes team. Um, I am a perpetual student. I will be until I die. So, um, you know, <laughs> I can say that I own that as well. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I am a certified restoration ecologist. So there's that. I think I hit a lot of places on this board. Um, so I guess that's me in a nutshell. Thank you. Thanks so much, Patty. Renee? Hey, I'm Renee, they, them pronouns. I guess I'm a youth according to the UN definition. I don't necessarily wouldn't describe myself that way, um, but currently unemployed. My last job was with the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. Um, I'm, I'm a volunteer community leader. I definitely identify as a volunteer. I spend a lot of time doing that. Um, I'm non-binary, gender queer, bisexual, so hitting that LGBTQIA plus. And that's a, those are probably enough affinity groups for me. Nice to be here. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Renee. Appreciate it. All right. Thank, uh, thanks so much, everyone, for, for participating. For those of you who participated, you know, still feel free to share in the chat if you have not had a chance to introduce yourself and feel comfortable. Um, otherwise, we're going to move on to kind of hearing a little bit about what is the UN decade and kind of how that structure works and, and how that comes into play with the work that each of you are doing in our community. All right. So a little bit about um, the UN decade. It was created by the UN General Assembly in March 2019 as a way of mobilizing resources to scale up restoration for biodiversity protection, climate resilience, and habitat protection. It serves as kind of a rallying cry for the protection revival of ecosystems around the world to benefit both humans and nature. And the aim of it is to halt the degradation of ecosystems and restore them as we work towards global goals. So this, um, the timeline of the UN decade is running from 2021 through 2030, which aligns with the um, deadline for the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, um, which replace the Millennium Development Goals. Um, but kind of there's these the 17 Sustainable Development Goals about like life on land, life on water, zero hunger, things like that. And so we're wanting to use this framework of the UN decade um, is just a way, you know, there's been a UN decade on oceans, for example, to uh, look at marine health and fisheries and things like that. So it's really just a way of bringing together resources and networks and, and um, help to push forward policies and 
and financing for these for this work. Um, so it's hosted jointly by UNEP, the UN Environmental Program, together with um, the FAO, the Food Agriculture Organization, in collaboration with the three Rio conventions. It, there's not gonna be a test on this. You don't need to know so much about who all the people or the, the organizations playing into this are. Um, but really just, we have, you know, the 2030 is really kind of this tipping point. Uh, you know, scientists have identified that as our last chance, you know, these last 10 years, whatever, seven years now, our last chance to prevent cataclysmic climate change. We're already seeing climate impacts with, you know, ocean level rising and and island nations in like Fiji and Vanuatu in the Pacific um, being threatened by, um, you know, they're, they're kind of going underwater and their potable water is being salinated. We're seeing, you know, increased climate emergencies um, and increased conflict around water and fuel. And so looking at, you know, some of the impacts that have already been faced, how can we stop, you know, kind of roll that back and try and protect, um, you know, and have more, you know, people planting a thousand trees like Rick. I love that. Um, so uh, this kind of go, this chart shows um, in 2019, following the announcement of the decade, um, UNEP reached out to some of their stakeholders to contribute to the design of the decade. And that was where I first heard about the work of the UN decade and how, how we could get involved. And so um, the I'm part of this group called the Major Group for Children and Youth, which is the official body for young professionals, students, and children to engage in UNEP proceedings. And so um, this organization convened a stakeholder engagement session in fall of 2019, ahead of COP25, which took place in Spain. Um, and we were just trying to solicit input from our membership. And then all of that, um, those inputs were compiled into a youth position paper. I'm not sure if anyone on this call was there, but um, Blue Stem hosted, um, that's the Chicago, the US Illinois one. Um, we um, hosted an event at the Bartlett Nature Preserve in um, November 2019, where we brought together about 26 people in person to have some of these conversations around how do we, um, you know, what does a decade on ecosystem restoration look like? Where are some of the needs and gaps? And how do we involve more young people in this practice and in this field? Um, so that um, paper that was compiled from all of these, um, I think it was 19 or 21 different stakeholder engagement uh, sessions. Those were put into a youth paper. That youth paper was submitted to UNEP to include in their strategy. And out of that, we actually got um, a lot of, of opportunities that came out of that. And so, um, oh, there we are, 25 consultations were hosted. And there's the picture at the bottom of those of us who were at the Bartlett Nature Center. Um, and so there were more than 2,000 comments that all went into this, um, this overall strategy. And what came out of it was um, the, there were five different, actually I'll go back a slide. There were five different uh, task forces that were formed, one on science, on monitoring, on, let's see if I can remember these all now, um, science, monitoring, um, oh my goodness. Yep, nope, totally blanking on this. Uh, but anyways, youth was one of the task forces that was formed. Uh, oh, science, monitoring, finance, youth, and nope, I can't remember the fifth one. I'm sorry. Um, oh, best practices. That's what it is. And so each of these task forces are bringing together professionals from around the globe to try and have um, kind of set some standards for how, um, um, the, how the world can engage in the decade, as well as um, they published a strategy paper um, that based off of this that talked about ways that more people could engage as like actors basically your organization can sign on and say hey we're committing to um building more arboretums or protecting you know a couple thousand hectares of land and, and that's going to be how we're connecting with this or it could be as simple as you know we want to continue uh, climate education and offering programming to um you know a hundred people a year or something like that so there's different ways that you can get involved with this. There's also, of course, financial ways if you're wanting to, you know, um, be a granting agency to UN Decade Partners and things like that. There's opportunities for, for money always through the UN, right? And so um, since then the next phase in, um, or this was in early 2023, um, the UN Decade published an action plan. 
that's based around 12 restoration challenges, these thematic areas where they want to scale up global society in ecosystem restoration. So they have one on youth, one on cities, one on business, one on finance, um, one on like rural development and agriculture, one on education. There are all these different challenges that they invited people to, okay, show us your plan for how you're going to scale up restoration, engage thousands or maybe even a million people in the work of the UN decade. So as part of this, the Youth Task Force put together the Green Jobs Program, which we hope to um, become a training program for ecosystem restoration practitioners to gain skills and mentorship through project-based learning. And we'll have a long-term goal of developing a skilled workforce just to meet the growing demands for restoration staff and encourage entrepreneurship in this field. So I think each of us have maybe seen, um, there's kind of two sides of the story. This is what we found when we talked to our membership. We saw um, that youth unemployment was an issue, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's as high as 30%. Latin America as well is like 25 to 28. Um, in the, you know, in North America, it's probably at its lowest. I think it was like maybe 12% or something like that. But either way, um, you know, young people are, are entering the workforce and, and looking for opportunities for a living wage, for, you know, a career that is fulfilling, an opportunity to, to connect with um, their ethical beliefs or morals, um, especially around climate change. And so there's, there's an interest in jobs in the green field. And on the other hand, if you talk in, if you sorry, if you've spoken with any landscaper or or hiring manager, they're like, there's no one wants to work. There aren't enough candidates. No one's qualified for the position or has the experience I need to just hit the ground running as soon as we hire them. You know, I don't have the capacity after a year of you know vacancies or you know COVID disruptions to spend a year training a new um, staff member. I need someone who has the experience and skills needed to just go when I hire them. And so there's this dichotomy. There's, there's this kind of gap between these two groups where both of them want to connect desperately, but they aren't, they aren't meeting each other's need. And so we wanted to kind of meet that gap with a training curriculum to provide skills on, you know, both formal education as well as informal skills. So a little bit of like, how do you restore an ecosystem when you encounter a, you know, a vacant, an open field? Where do you start? As well as, you know, more, more specifics like, um, you know, how do you um, maintain small equipment, small engines, um, like chainsaws and brush saws? How do you keep those operating safely and, and effectively, you know, um, use, you know, and, and change the carburetor and things like that, that, you know, I certainly did learn um, in, you know, going to college at UW Parkside. Um, it was online. There was no way to teach me how to, you know, operate a chainsaw, right? And so all that I learned through internships and practical experiences. So we want to kind of blend those two pieces of on the ground opportunities, as well as, um, you know, kind of classroom instruction. And we're going to be training our youth on these five tracks, policy advocacy, capacity building, agribusiness, climate resilience, and land management. And as we're starting to think about like how, what we should include in the curriculum, because that's what this consultation is all about. You know, what are the needs and gaps? How do we set up this curriculum? And, and what needs to be included in it? Um, make sure you're thinking kind of a little bit more globally. So um, this curriculum is going to be modified slightly to meet each uh, region. So, you know, if we're in a forested area, I'm not gonna be teaching them about the tall grass prairie we have in Illinois. Uh, but things that, like that are more broad or general, we want to include. And then when this curriculum comes to the United States, you know, what do we need to make sure is included in that? Is it, you know, do we need, you know, a lot of peatland management? Maybe not as much as we need more general wetland management techniques and training and skills. So just keep that in mind as we move forward. Okay. Um, so here's kind of the process we're in. So right now we're in that curriculum development and recruitment process. We are probably, you know, maybe six months behind. So we're just kind of getting started with these consultations and they're going to go into early 2024. And then we're going to launch this uh, curriculum first in the Latin American Caribbean region um, and then move around the globe really based on where we saw the most need in terms of ecosystem restoration as well as that un uh, youth unemployment. So moving to um, kind of sub-Saharan Africa, 
then Asia Pacific, and then going to the Middle East and North Africa region, as well as Western Asia. Then we're moving to our small island developing states. So that's, you know, Pacific, Caribbean, and Indian Ocean um, island nations, typically. And then finally, um, you know, kind of our more developed um, economies in Western Europe, Oceania, and North America, finally. And so, um, you know, we have a lot to cover. We want to engage um, lots of young people in these programs. And so um, we just um, are really trying to hear, um, you know, what skills are needed to work in this field, what barriers exist, and what hiring professionals are using as deciding factors when looking for the right candidate. Our curriculum needs to be globally relevant, culturally informed, and utilize resources and subject matter experts kind of connected to those local ecotypes. Um, so there will be, like I said, there's going to be some, some kind of regional um, shifts and in, in, uh, differences to uh, the curriculum as we implement it. But overall, we want to have kind of some global initiatives and, and global expertise that's shared. Okay. So we're going to get started with just one practice question. And I'm going to launch our, <clears throat> excuse me, our whiteboard tool in just a sec. Um, but we're going to, so this practice, and, and then we're going to break out, I'm sorry, we're going to launch the whiteboard and then we're going to work in breakout groups. So um, Laura is going to help me set that up. And so we're going to have a couple different breakout groups that I believe you'll be able to self-select into. Um, you know, Laura, did you want to, um, I don't know if you have that set up yet um, or are going to, we don't, again, we don't need to, we're going to do this question kind of as a group first as we practice using the whiteboard. Um, and we also have the meeting chat as well as a way that you can share information. Um, and so let me open that now. Where's the toolbar? Um, I might need to pause my screen share. We practiced this beforehand, and right now I'm just not seeing the whiteboard. Laura, do you see it on your end? Oh, here we are. Sorry, I'm sorry, I was muted. I don't see, I do not see the whiteboard right now. Uh, let's see. There it is. Okay. Can everyone see that? Great. Yes. All right. So the, we're going to start with our practice question. And so on the whiteboard, as um, as it opens, you might see, um, you know, kind of a Zoom, uh, kind of like quick uh, demonstration or, or guideline of how to use it. But what we're going to do is on the left-hand side of your screen, there are, um, that's where the toolbar is. And we're gonna be using two main ones. We're gonna use the sticky note. And so I can create a sticky note and put that in the center here. And I'm gonna write, you know, what our first question is here. Um, what do you wish you knew as a young person? And that, that sticky note can be dragged around and moved and placed in different areas. We're also going to use the comment button. And so I can comment on this and say, I wish I knew how to use a chainsaw before I started my career. And then you can comment on that. Now you can reply to a comment, ditto, or whatever you want to add. Um, you can see these. Um, just to note, these are um, none of these um, interventions are anonymous. Your name is connected with it. So um, just in case you're uh, writing something inappropriate, just, you know, double checking. We do know who's writing it and things like that. So, you know, sometimes you see people drawing randomly on whiteboards as they're testing out the tools. Um, for like the pen, for example, um, if you click on the pen, you'll see the options to erase that or change the color. But um, sticking to the sticky notes and comments is going to be easiest for us today. So I'm just going to put a header for our, this is our practice question, and invite each of you to respond um, to this 
practice question in a group before we split out. Um, so what do you wish you knew as a young person that when, um, that would shape your career? Um, and then our second part of that is what barriers did you face in um, finding a job in the in, um, ecosystem restoration field? And then finally, do young people today face those same barriers? How bar what what what's changed in hiring practices that make it easier or harder for for young people to enter the workforce? Kim says, I wish I knew there were jobs in ag other than farming. Yeah, I think, you know, we hear about, okay, you can be a firefighter, you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer in school, but you don't hear you can be, a you know, a researcher in, that studies frogs or something, right? You don't learn about that until you're in school. And then it's like, wait, there are eight jobs in this field? Whoa, didn't know, definitely didn't know that when I um, was, you know, studying sustainability in college. I remember my parents, um, I, tr I actually transferred to UW from a different school and they said like, Sarah, you know, with a degree in sustainable management, like what jobs are out? Like, who's gonna hire you and pay you to do that? Cause like, you're gonna pay a lot for school. Like make sure you, you're gonna make money eventually on it, right? And at the time I told them, well, you know, Apple has a chief sustainability officer. So I could be that. And I knew that that's not what I wanted to do. That wasn't, you know, what what fit my goals and my vocational um, path that I wanted to be on to, you know, go work for um, a company that um, out in California. That wasn't what I wanted to do. I really wanted to invest in community partnerships. And and so finding this job at Blue Stem was just a game changer. I didn't know that there were, um, you know, commercial restoration teams, you know. So love seeing some of these um, face barrier, um, oops, I can't read this, um, with um, two introductory positions without a long commute. Yeah, um, you know, finding places that it's like, okay, I need a living wage that also pays me for three hours of drive time, right? Um, that's a lot of time that you're not making money, right? And in the landscape industry, we also hear of, you know, oh, you're only paid for, um, one way of the commute, you know, from the office to the job site, you're only paid one direction. Well, I'm in the truck for both ways. Why am I not being paid for this time? So those are some of just the industry practices that I think serve as barriers. Um, experience is keen. Everyone has to learn new skills at one time or another. So don't be intimidated. Try something new. Yeah. Learning that, um, you know, it's okay to not know everything is really helpful and knowing, you know, asking questions is a sign of, you know, maturity in the job field, even if it feels scary. Um, knowledge intensive and labor intensive. Yeah, um, that is one thing that I love about this um, industry is you get to use both your mind and your body, kind of fatigue them both throughout the day. So you're not going home and like, Ugh, my brain is, is, you know, on fire, but my body's tired or vice versa. You know, that imbalance can always lead to, you know, you not being able to fall asleep right away, things like that. Um, I'm gonna move this one out here. Uh, barrier because of lack of experience in the field and how ecosystem specific the experience was in order to get hired. Yeah, so if you've worked in California and then come to work in Illinois, it's a totally different ecosystem. The plant communities that you spend all this time learning, you know, zero relevance pretty much between those different ecosystems. Young people today live and work close to their families. Um, I've seen someone writing. So yeah, these are all really great um, conversations and notes that people have.
in some comments in many places around the world, yes, there are the same barriers um, and lots of barriers based on gender and ethnicity. Uh, Gen Z are advancing fast and jumping over Gen X and millennials for leadership roles. Yeah, really interesting to see. Um, as a Gen X, I was up against the highly educated baby boomer population and doubled down and double major to get two degrees in order to be competitive. Yeah, it's really interesting seeing how schooling kind of plays into this. Like, do I get the master's degree? Do I get the advanced degree in order to make myself a better candidate? Or do I go into the field without experience, without that competitive edge and take that, you know, kind of um, entry level position and see if I can work my way up? Being female was a significant barrier. There were opportunities that were missed out on because of that. Um, it would be illegal for a hiring manager to admit today, but still an issue. Careers are very long-term with lots of starts and false starts, um, but at least we have second chances. To make significant jumps in salary, jumping from agency to agency and going outside your comfort zone. You know, you can't always expect your boss to, you know, to give you that 20% pay jump or whatever that you want or need to, in order to start a family, for example. Um, so seeing how that works, yeah. These are all really awesome interventions. So are we ready to jump into the next part of the consultation? Maybe give a thumbs up. I can't see many faces, but uh, yeah, we're ready to go. All, all right. right. I will open up the breakout rooms. Great. Thank you so much. Welcome back, everybody. Laura, I'm hopeful that you and the other group was able to share the questions. Did that work out? I wasn't in the other group. How did that group? So I stay as a host. I stay in the main oh, okay. in case someone gets booted out. So how did it go? Group, other group, <laughs> some representatives here. Did you have the questions for the no. consultation? No. Okay, shoot. All right, I'm gonna have to figure out. I was, um, I was hoping that the whiteboard would stay open or my screen would share stay open, but it looks like that did not happen. So, Laura, as we go into the next um, breakout so room, what we can do is we can drop it into the chat if somebody um, just if everybody just copies those questions into um, it copies those questions when you go into the breakout room, you can discuss it there, or we can stay in one room. However, you feel most comfortable. Okay. Yeah, you know what? Why don't we just stay in one room? Then we can keep the same whiteboard, maybe, um, as we go yeah. back and forth. Um, still trying to figure that out. So apologize for the tech difficulties and sorry. Um, hopefully you were able to have a conversation still in the other group. Do you want to share if you talked about anything or if it was a really awkward like 10 minutes of just like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do? Um, we made it up as we went along, Sarah. Uh, and I think we did okay. Uh, actually, it was interesting because um, uh, I, unfortunately she had to go, uh, but there was another participant who was in our group um, who started off kind of with a theme that I had also been thinking about. And that is that, you know, there are um, a number of training programs uh, in the region that are worth um, I think looking to to um, get some feedback, get some input. Um, one of them is the Conservation Corps, um, which is part of the, the Friends of the Forest Preserve, Cook County. Um, one, another one is the Youth Conservation Corps here in Lake County. Um, and, I, you know, there are probably a few others that I'm not thinking of, but um, and so I think that they would be whoever's involved with kind of the management or oversight might be a good um, good contact 
for you as part of this process. So that was something that I thought about. Um, and then just as we were kind of leaving, um, one of the things that I thought, um, I think it was you probably, Rebecca, that said something in the group that we were in about um, one of the difficulties with hiring people the, their first job right out of the gate is that they then take the training that they get and then they go elsewhere. Um, and so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, they, that, that training, really whatever that is, is really uh, valuable. It's valuable, but it's also, you know, uh, expensive from the employer's perspective, but valuable from an employee's perspective. So yeah, and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll add on that just a little bit um, because I think it is a problem with the market that gets back to exactly what you're trying to create. It, that's more, more people with the training. So I think there, it's so limited. If I train someone, somebody else will, I mean, I paid to train them. I'm keeping them at a certain rate because they're in training. Somebody else offers them a, uh, some higher amount of money and they're gone. And, uh, it, it's because everybody's having the same problem and correct me if I'm wrong, everyone, but, um, there's just not a lot of people who have the experience we are all looking for. Yeah, absolutely. So it's like you and if you as the employer have to invest the time to train them, and then as soon as they're done, they go and leave to another group, um, organization. This is something I heard the last time I did this, uh, conversation with prep last month or maybe two months ago now, um, the friends, the, uh, I'm sorry, the Fox River Ecosystem Partnership, the watershed group for the Fox River in Illinois. And that was what kept coming up that, you know, P, um, you know, entry level techs or, for, uh, you know, level one techs are working for a year at one company and then jumping to another company because, you know, there's a little bit of a pay increase or where their buddy tells them that, you know, it's better working conditions or, you know, this issue that, that kind of a pain point for them is, is resolved, it's closer to home, whatever it might be. And then, you know, that hopping around means that, you know, each employer feels a little bit dissatisfied that they invest in training, but they didn't kind of get that person to stay on for another season so they could really reap the rewards. And at the same time, the individual probably feels like they don't have opportunities for that advancement because they've only been there for a year and so they don't get to move up to management positions. So it's kind of like no one, no one ends up feeling good about that situation either. So if we can remove the, um, you know, whether employees pay, employers pay into a program that can support this, um, so that it's kind of like a more egalitarian that we all have a chance to hire these these graduates or something like that. Uh, but definitely to Patty's point, um, connecting with existing resources, and so we don't want to reinvent the wheel of how to train up a new ecological restoration tech. You know, let's go to the Morton Arboretum and say, will you host this curriculum in partnership with the programming that you already offer your, um, you know, natural areas volunteer program and things like that, a volunteer leadership program, I'm sorry, um, mm -hmm. like the Conservation Corps and say, okay, we're going to funnel everyone into Friends of the Forest Preserve. You do a year of service there and then you come out to the commercial, um, you know, <clears throat> workforce and, and come do ecological restoration and natural areas stewardship for us. Who knows? Um, but it'd be really great to just really raise up the level of engagement for people. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, I'm gonna meet myself, take a sip of water while you all talk about um, what else uh, you shared. Yeah, I don't know what you guys um, were talking about in the other group. What were the what were the actual questions? Uh, let's see, they're in the chat. Let's see. Um, uh, what do we have? Oh, there we go. All right. So I just shared those questions from that first round, as well as the screen grab oh. that um, Rick recommended. I get of the whiteboard we were using. Um, Laura and I had practiced the whiteboard. We'd actually set up a couple slides beforehand. Those disappear apparently every time you, you create a new whiteboard. So 
again, still a learning process with tech always, it feels like. But we were talking about, um, there were kind of two parts to it. First was, um, you know, what do, what what do green jobs look like? What opportunities are out there? Um, <clears throat> and what do students or or young people know about careers in the green industry? And then the second uh, kind of second part of the, those question list is what skills are needed to get a job in ecosystem restoration? What what are those barriers faced by people trying to access uh, job opportunities? And um, you know what does ecosystem restoration kind of look like um, for youth and or what what I'm sorry what does it look like in the Chicagoland area for youth unemployment for youth and ecosystem restoration? And, and how can, what are some practices that we can replicate? So, you know, Patty, you know, you kind of got right into it with the Conservation Corps and YCC. Those are, you know, perfect examples of that last question. How can, what are programs that can be replicated? So. Seeing these questions, anything else you want to add? I can chime in something, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so working across all these outside suburbs around Chicago land and every town has a park district that every year hires anywhere between 100 to 250 seasonal employees. Uh, every parks department hires anywhere between five to 25 to 40 seasonal employees to basically come out and help maintain the land. So you're gonna talk about an entry point, someplace where someone's gonna get their feet wet Got a lot of people's feet wet of young college kids fresh out of high school looking for a summer job. They wanted to work outside. They wanted to work out in the sunlight instead of underneath neon lights. So we would get people in every year. Every town has them. And getting the basic land management practices of just cutting the grass, string trimming, picking up garbage, learning how much the public loves to destroy public land, um, cleaning up. <laughs> after events and seeing how much people use that kind of land, but learning your basics of, this is what it takes to maintain open land. Here's on the challenges. Here are the beautiful sunrises. You get to be on a mower and ride out there and learn to operate tractors and equipment. Uh, every park district is going to be working on some kind of repair, restoration, um, planting, memorials. They're always ripping up something and always rebuilding something. And, and those young youth, are always on those crews and those jobs are open every year and they're typically never get completely filled. So just about every town in the entire region around here has jobs that are basically entry point for anybody wanting to learn what the basics of land management is. And from there, they will spark interest either going into trees, going into, some are perfectly happy just be on a mower and doing that at various other places. Um, some way to get into the restoration end and start working with uh, learning about the invasives going inside of the savannas that are being restored and uh, getting that aspect. So there's a lot of avenues they can break off into. And typically we'd get them back uh, two, three, four years in a row. Some went into that industry, some just stuck it in their back pocket as a, uh, oh, what did one of the guys tell me? It was his um, uh, future husband, book of abilities that he was uh, chalking up so he can learn how to take care of a household <laughs> and be okay. useful in that sense. But in general, park systems everywhere have entry jobs every year that open up by the hundreds come March. And they usually lead to full-time jobs and the entire industry has a vacuum of people and is on the job training. And um, yeah, people jump around, but they might be at one park system, one agency for three, four, five, six years and jump up someplace else, or they might become a lifer and just make a life of it. So um, I guess that's my two cents on it. Um, Thanks, a lot, of, a lot of support for it and not enough people. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rick. I don't know if y'all can hear me. My Zoom has frozen. We can hear you. We just can't. Oh, yeah, okay. we can hear well, you that's fine. Because I could hear Rick that whole time. I just can't. Um, I feel like it looks like my camera's frozen on my end and um, I can't click on anything. So I can't share my screen or put anything in the chat, Laura. So, um, so okay, I'll um, you to share the next 
round of questions, if you don't mind. Sure, I'll, I'll share the next round of questions. I turned my camera off. If everybody else wants to, I invite you all to do that. If Sometimes that helps um, with frozen screens. I don't know why. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not, I, I still see your faces, which is weird. Um, and I cannot turn off my camera. That button is also missing oh or, you know, blocked um, out. It's really strange. Um, but that's okay. We can um, share the next round of questions. And so this um, part of the consultation goes more into kind of the participation and administration of this program. Um, and so, you know, what's kind of, what would be the timeline that you'd like to see for a program like this in our community? Um, if we were to, you know, you know, would this be something that, you know, a, a fresh employee from your organization you, um, your organization would support them to go attend the training. Um, our goal would be to make this as low cost as possible um, for both the implementers as well as the participants. Um, so we, you know, we'd be looking to charge, you know, just kind of nominal fees to cover costs that we're not able to raise through grants or other fundraising. So um, just kind of taking that out of, you know, the cost out of the equation as much as possible. Um, you know, what would be fair to pay our instructors, you know, um, obviously we, you know, there's a lot of opportunities where there's like a subject matter expert who's called in for, you know, a one day session or like a training, you know, should we make sure that they are receiving some sort of compensation for their time for that day? Or it, do we think that there's enough um, interest from uh, professionals in this kind of career development for young people that, um, you know, they would come in for free? Um, you know, how long should the program last? Should it be three weeks, six weeks, longer? Um, what's a good timeline where we can do a really intensive, you know, uh, training for uh, young people to learn the skills needed to enter this workforce? Any thoughts on that? This is, this is a really difficult um, conundrum that I've been thinking about almost the whole time that we've been talking. And and it is, um, I think uh, there have been lots of programs, there's been lots of talk about training people um, and having training programs that are available. I think that, you know, that we need entry level training opportunities, et cetera. Um, but I also think that there's kind of a disconnect on the other side, and that is, you know, sort of sustainable job opportunities kind of at the more professional level. Um, and, and people who end up getting frustrated by having these kinds of training opportunities. So, I, I mean, I, I think that having training is really important. Um, and I, I guess what I would rather see is something that's long term um, as training, you know, a year uh, actual on the ground training where people get job skills and get, you know, some of the barriers out of their way. But I think most importantly, there needs to be a real feeder system into full time employment, which I'm not sure really exists. I mean, Rick was talking about lots of seasonal jobs, and I think that that's um, important, but what do they do in the off season? So are you, are you, you know, getting people who um, are just have some time, you know, because they're still in school? What about people who aren't in school? Um, what about people who have left school and, you know, want to make a break into this career but can't find the opportunity to do that and can't afford to do it only part-time or seasonally. Um, I, I think that there's, I, I, it's just, it's really, um, I, I see, I, let's, I see that, I see the problem from both sides, I guess, is what I'm trying to communicate. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, Patty. And I think that we hear that often. We've heard that for others is that, they move on, find another job after that, if they're looking for full-time employment in 
not in the conservation sector, if it's a seasonal job that ends in the summer and they end up going to somewhere else, then it's hard to get them back at the mm -hmm. end yeah. of that. So. Yeah, and like you said, you know, there's there's kind of these costs involved for both parties, both the employers and and the employees to be able to um, access this workforce. And so how can, you know, those costs, whether it be <clears throat> financial costs or time invested, um, it's really hard to figure out what's the right amount to offer and, and at what point is it, you know, costing our business more than it's worth. And or, you know, as an individual, how much of my of my personal savings am I willing to spend on additional schooling and training? Um, or should my employer be paying that? But then the employer's like, well, if you're only going to stay with me for a year, you know, how much do I want to invest in that person? So um, really kind of setting a standard for our industry of, you know, um, what what expectations should be like, because especially as a young person um, trying to say, hey, will you, will you pay for this cost for me? Or, um, you know, I really can't afford to wait for reimbursement for this, you know, hundred plus dollar training program. Will you cover that cost for me? Um, and if, you know, if I don't pass the herbicide exam or whatever, you know, the next one's on me, I get that or, or whatever, you know, making sure that those costs are, are realistic for both parties. Now, what would you like to see in terms of the, the timeline for this program? Do you think a um, you know, a three-week program, a six-week program would be best for for some sort of on-the-ground training. You know, maybe it's in in the month of April, or we do something kind of during the growing season as well to get you know high school or college freshman, sophomore, um, you know, folks who may not be ready for a full-time position. Um, or maybe we're doing, you know, can we do it in the winter? What what considerations should come into play as we're talking about the timing of this program. I'll chime in. This is Rebecca. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like three weeks would be great to launch somebody into an intro position. And then also somebody else suggested a year. That would also be great for a more long-term full-time position if they could uh, get experience throughout the calendar year and all the different things that happen during that year, get all their certifications, maybe get chainsaw and small equipment training and that sort of thing. Uh, as an employer, I would be attracted to somebody who had that training to hire them full-time. Yeah. Um, but the three week is also useful for, for the people we hire as seasonals. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think, you know, because it is so, you know, the work we do is, is seasonally dependent. You can only herbicide certain species different times of the year. And I remember my first year was like, whoa, every single day plants look different. And how do I know what I'm looking at is the same as what I saw, you know, two weeks ago, last time I was in the same site or whatever. And, and so understand the phenology of plants and, and what they look like at different parts of their life cycle. You do kind of need, I mean, three weeks, you certainly can't see a plant grow, you know, from, from seed to rosette to full bloom and then and then dried. It looks totally different in the winter. And so because we need plant ID to be, you know, kind of year round skill, not just, you know, when it's flowering. Yeah, I think a year long program, you know, maybe similar to the Friends of the Forest Preservers, you know, looking more at what they do uh, would be a really great opportunity to have, okay, um, you know, that experience. Another um, program that's similar that I'd like to highlight, <coughs> excuse me, is um, the CLIP program, the Conservation Leaders um, Internship Program through the uh, Linton Conservancy of McHenry County. It's a 10-week internship um, led by Kim and Meg on their team, uh, Kim Elsenbrook and Megan Oropesa, I believe. And they put together a really cool program that combines um, on the ground experience. They're doing the land management at Henner Conservation Area and other sites um, that I think Wolf Oaks Preserve um, up towards like Harvard um, or Wonder Lake, I should say, that the Land Conservancy manages. But then they're also hearing from um, different uh, career about 
different careers. They're hearing from different professionals about what they do. They're taking field trips to like Medewin in Achusa, see the bison. Um, they're, they're doing a research project as well where they're studying um, and putting together like a paper at the end of it. You know, maybe it's not getting published, but they're learning all the kind of a variety of different skills related to the field, not just, okay, here's how to be a tech. And so I think it's a good opportunity that, you know, helps them to see, you know, here's what you're currently qualified for, but here's how you can scale that for growth. Awesome. Um, yeah. Rick just shared in the chat too. Thank you. Um, yeah, starting as a seasonal and, and growing up um, and, and working to, um, you know, using overtime during the season, almost like talking about like, hey, how do you, you know, you're working overtime during the season. How are you saving those dollars to make it through the off season? You know, what does that look like from a personal finance um, role, you know, position? Laura, were you going to say something? Sorry, I interrupted. No, no. Okay, no. sorry about that. Uh, Mark, thanks for joining us uh, from the Field Museum, I see. Um, I'm just going to copy again the questions that we're um, talking about and share those so that you can see. I'm not sure where, when you joined. Um, but these are some of the questions we're talking about today of just, you know, what would a program for, um, you know, an ecological restoration training look like? so that we have opportunities for, for young people, um, you know, kind of in that, you know, early career professional timeline, you know, some students as well, to learn what it looks like to, to enter into this workforce. Um, what are some of the skills that they need to learn? Um, what type of instruction should be provided? And, and who should be doing it? Are there different resources that we've used in our past that would be great opportunities to include in this? you know, whether on a global level or specific to the Chicagoland region, when we get, you know, Morton Arboretum to host this course for us or something, which is a total goal of mine. <laughs> and thanks, Patty, so much for joining. Understood you got to leave, but um, thanks so much for your contribution so far. Hey, Winton, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Wouldn't yeah. I, in fact, if you wanted to just talk a little bit about the work that you do with Urban Efficiency Group, I think it's actually really relevant to this. It's like the, you know, getting the opposite representation um, to this conversation. And I think it would be really good to hear your feedback. Yeah, you know, a lot of different angles and ways to look at this, to draw connections to what I do. Um, I'm a director of sustainability at Urban Efficiency Group. Um and we're a sustainability design firm, uh, typically working with municipalities to assist them in building uh, more community development, more inclusive, intentional, um, and equitable community development plans and approaches um, in terms of building a better society. You know, community should always be an integral part of that process, approach, and thought concept as a whole. Um, so with that, we serve C4, the Cross Community Climate Collaborative. Um, about 14 communities in West Cook County, um, Broadview, Bellwood, Riverside, Westchester, City of Berwyn. Um, it, it's a nice cluster of, of, of communities that have kind of gotten on the same terms of sustainability solidarity. Um, and that just means in, in every portion of society, um, in the way that we view sustainability as a system, um, there are just so many ways that we can improve our quality of life, how we interact with each other um, and the different approaches to that pathway, um, which I, this is a, definitely a very interesting conversation, um, ecological restoration, uh, because while we could, you know, focus um, primarily on, you know, industry, what the industry always says, ecological res restoration is a community and universal concept, right? Um, so I'm sure there's a lot of things that are specifically industry focused, but then you think about um, the emerging technology and the adoption of that emerging technology. We have a green landscape technology campaign right now that's focused solely on the electrification of this very diesel and gas powered industry. You know, how can we do that? Well, you know, we need to work with contractors. We need to work with associations and institutions um, that are experts within the conservation environmental field 
Uh, because as much as we're focusing on green landscape technology itself, you know, that's not what's going to push the needle. It's it's going to be, you know, conservationists, environmentalists, ecological restoration folks that take it beyond just this one subset of the industry. You know, it could be um, a widely availed resource and information, you know, that we're in implementing and introducing to society. Um, so this is definitely a very interesting conversation, Sarah, because those, you know, I have similar thoughts and hopes to bring Martin Arboretum <laughs> into the GLT campaign um, because it just makes sense. You know, everyone's trying to um, adopt and um, shift, you know, with the times. But one, how do you do that without access to the resources? And two, it's so much harder to do when you're disjointed, disconnected and working in silos. Um, so, you know, that's a huge portion of what I'm doing. Um, but also, I think another reason why um, Laura had invited me and also Ted flagged it for me as well is that we're actively recruiting for and recruiting for a workforce development program for energy efficiency technicians. So the, the same challenges that, you know, folks have in, in this field with, you know, trying to find folks, trying to get them engaged and really invested in the industry for a career opportunity, that those are similar uh, struggles and challenges that I'm facing right now. I'm recruiting for energy efficiency technicians too. So I know that was a lot, but. <laughs> no, that was awesome. Thanks so much, Winton. Um, yeah, we. I think it's really um, sometimes surprising when you, you start to see, um, you know, a different kind of subsect of of the workforce entering um, into your um, organization. So um, two years ago, we had um, a veteran and a National Guard uh, Reserve member uh, join our crew at the same time. And it was really exciting because that was not an area of, you know, kind of the workforce that we were actively recruiting in, but they proved to be really hard. I mean, you know, they've got this discipline of hard work already built into them. They're, they're used to, you know, kind of being, you know, pushed to the bottom of the barrel and doing all that heavy lifting, the hard work that the military tends to put you through. Um, they had some machine operator training as well. And so, you know, while they didn't have the ecological restoration side, they didn't have a degree in biology or environmental science, um, they had this, you know, some skills that were really relevant to the work we did. I know uh, Courtney dropped off, but she had shared that she is a military veteran. And, um, you know, looking at different community groups that, you know, aren't the first thing that comes to mind, you know, it's not, you know, a college student or, or um, you know, someone who's been volunteering for a um, conservation group, but, you know, what are the other communities that we can reach out to and provide these opportunities with to provide um, those community connections and build, you know, these intentional spaces like Wynton was saying um, that can bring people together towards these shared goals because we see you know it's not like you know different communities don't value nature um, like like I might or how I was raised uh, to do so but um, people do it in different ways and so I'm um, looking at what are what are the connections that we can make that um, can serve as a bridge to different communities to engage in this work. Um, yeah, so, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying it's a great conversation, you know, literally trying to figure out what is this infrastructure, you know, this workforce development infrastructure that isn't just um, single serving, you know, you know, it's, it's duplicative, you know, multi-pronged approach. Um, and how do you do that for multiple industries is what I've been trying to figure out. Um, without, you know, inviting that that vibe or attitude of, of competition, because the reality is we, we need every workforce <laughs> to be flowing and moving and functioning. Um, but how can we do that collectively? You know, it's definitely a task at hand. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, obviously not everyone who goes through this workforce development person is going to come out, you know, super engaged and committed to a lifelong career in ecosystem restoration. That's too much to hope for. But, you know, what are the skills that they can take away from this training that would be applicable to, 
you know, any profession, whether they go into sales or marketing or, um, you know, HR, who knows, um, you know, uh, working for a, a labor union, working in construction, you know, what are the takeaways from this pro or what are things that we can include in this program that can serve as kind of universal, um, you know, career training? Just, you know, I'm asking all the easy questions, try to get those out of the way now, right? <laughs> Just try to, you know, the next we'll talk about Gaza and Israel and then world peace and all that stuff too, okay? <laughs> I apologize for the like light bubbles on my face. Um, I don't, I we recently rearranged our office and I'm still getting used to, um, the, the light as it changes on a daily basis and where it is and where it'll be during calls. So sorry about that. No, it looks, actually looks nice. <laughs> yeah, no worries at all. Um, in terms of the, the, the training, um, are there certifications involved? I'm, I'm sorry, I was on majority of the meeting, but I was also... <laughs> doing a lot of other stuff too well that's what we're trying to figure out is what certification should we include you know doing um you know i think um getting a pesticide license is probably something that would be really helpful for for most people who graduate from this program or or at least for most employers that's something that we're seeing um is really in the at least specifically ecosystem restoration or agriculture or nursery growing you know that's a skill set that's really desired um, prescribed burn training is something else. Um, and while prescribed burning is not something that I'm hoping is being done in the, um, you know, solar energy field, um, looking at how do we mitigate risk related to fire? What are hazards that can be identified? And that's something that, you know, perhaps can be translatable. Um, but, you know, and even in sustainable agriculture or organic agriculture, there's still, um, there's still spray out of organic um, herbicides or pesticides that can be used. And so even going into those industries, I think understanding how a pesticides work is something that would be really relevant. What other yeah, certifications yeah, do you know of or, or think would be helpful? Have, have you explored GIS certifications? Because I think that that's really applicable today more than ever. Yeah, I, um, Rick, maybe you can speak to this, but we're seeing more municipalities um, undergoing asset management, um, you know, uh, campaigns per se, where they're map, um, I, you know, Rick, I call on you because I know, um, I think Burden Hills did this, where they do like a tree inventory, or they're mapping all of their um, storm sewer inlets and, and outlets so that they know they can, um, when there's a problem, they can, you know, send you, okay, here's the pin of where it needs to be and can track all of the maintenance that's been done on that site, et cetera. So yeah, GIS is a huge, huge field that there's also a massive vacuum in right now. There's not enough people to fill that field because both municipalities, um, public works are mapping all their electrical lines, all their natural gas, but yada, yada, yada. Um, and parks districts, yes, are doing GIS inventories of their assets as well as their tree inventories. Um, there's a lot of the grants through um, the Chicago Tree Initiative, I believe it is, that for uh, getting grants so that you can get inventories done of your trees. But there are full-time positions at almost most agencies at this point in time that their sole purpose is to start inventorying every bench, every light pole, every uh, garbage can, uh, every tree, everything you got inside the system is the map. And that's something that's going to take like a generation to probably map because there's, how do you map hundreds and hundreds of acres worth of stuff. So it's a very, it's a growing field and it's just getting started and there's like nobody there to fill it at this point in time. Yeah, okay, that's a that's something that was not kind of on my radar to include in this. I hadn't been thinking about that. So really glad both of you are kind of endorsing that um, idea. And I think, again, GIS is something that, you know, literally in the name is going to be a globally relevant um, opportunity that I think would be really great to provide, you know, you know, just try out, even if we start with a free program like Google Earth, and then work up to our GIS and um, opportunities to to work with that software and, and understand how it works. Mm -hmm. 
it seems to me too that there'd be a lot of people on the ground with the handheld unit that just need mm -hmm. to know how to enter the data and fewer people behind the computer compiling all that data into the GIS maps. So maybe there is like two layers of training that you could provide there. Mark, do you have any uh, insight from Citizen uh, or iNetro side and the work that you're doing with this? I think it might be relevant here. Um, yeah, I guess as you were talking, I was thinking about the the grant that we've that we're applying for with NOAA and and the idea that potentially we'd have some funds to try to work with folks to kind of do some of this train the trainer work, right? Of getting people doing GIS work in different communities. And I was thinking like, how do you decide which communities to focus your work in and you know what that selection process looks like? Um, or whether they self-select or whether like how we go about encouraging different organizations to, to um, get involved and, and communities. Um, so I don't know a lot about C4. I'm just trying to read up on it now. And I'm sorry that I missed the first hour of this. I was writing to Laura actually saying like, um, is this conversation being recorded? And she said, it's still going on. So jump in here and join. But, um, but yeah, with um, our work, um, Currently, so I, I help with the you know the designing of the platform CW um, A uh, Green Initiatives, which is like a GIS platform to track how we're doing on all our different initiatives, and we constantly need more folks engaged and working in all those different seven initiatives that we have, and GIS plays a big role in how we both gather the data and and look at. Um, um, look at trends across the region, across all of those different conservation goals. And so getting more people engaged would be super helpful for us, especially diverse audiences that know what's happening in different parts of the whole region. Awesome. Yeah. So, okay. I'm, so, I'm really glad that we brought up GIS because, um, <laughs> yeah, it seems like everyone is using it and the applications of it are just endless. Um, so whether it's, you know, mapping the, you know, it's like as you're training someone on how to use GIS, you can map the locations of GIS professionals who are now trained in it and, and put that up, you know, as a layer on your map. And um, as we as we plant trees, you know, mapping where those are being done, map, um, you know, whether um, I did an internship a few years, uh, well, I guess now more than a few years ago with um the Chicago Living Corridors, which was working with the Conservation Foundation and now is being, I just got an email yesterday that it's going to be kind of absorbed into the Conservation Foundation and they're mapping all of the conservation at home sites um, and layering that with, um, actually, I think you can see all of it on um, the, there's like an Illinois, um, through Prairie State Conservation Initiative, there's um, kind of a, a global map that shows the different layers of here are all the municipal park district to open space. Here's all the state parks. Here's the forest preserve sites. Here's the conservation at home private land. Here's um, the different easements that are filed by all the land trusts in Illinois. And you can kind of layer all that on to start to see, you know, where are their habitat corridors? Where do we need to, you know, fill in gaps in these corridors so that, for example, you know, along the Fox River, or along the DuPage River, we have these connected corridors of um, protected land, whether it is permanently protected easement or a public land or a privately held land that's also being brought into um, res restoration. Yeah, and oh, that's yeah. also really related to a lot of work we're currently doing now. Um, with Field Museum, we're focused on urban wildlife corridors and trying to map those out across the whole Chicago Wilderness Alliance region. Mm -hmm. um, and with a big focus on rights of ways, and there's a whole other group on who's doing research at, mm -hmm. out of UIC on, um, yeah. on those rights of ways and how to, yeah, how to prioritize that work and where restoration is done. So anyway, you're touching on all those topics that I think we've got a lot of overlap with as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Rick, you were about to say something. <laughs> the only thing I was gonna say is something that GIS is probably not being thought about being used for is tracking as plants 
are dying off in the region. So one of the things that we were taught when we set our GIS up in Vernon Hills was don't delete, even if you cut down something that died off, don't delete the record that you'd removed it and why you removed it. Because over time, as things die off, you'll have a record of what was there, why did it perhaps die off and not survive in that area anymore. So it's just kind of a, a record. Yeah, that's really interesting because, yeah, we need to track plant diseases and and um, see where, you know, soil salinification from road salt are impacting, you know, our ability to restore that ecosystem in the future. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the kind of the plant community, the plant skills, um, but, you know, we haven't talked about partially because I don't work in this space. Um, you know, Mark, you mentioned wildlife workers and, um, you know, how much of this program would you expect to include um, wildlife management training? And um, is that something that your organization works with or monitors? Um, you know, maybe doing, you know, you're doing a transect monitor and you're doing a, you know, a bird or butterfly or bee monitor as part of the training program. What do you expect that to look like? Um, so we, I do have colleagues that work a lot with, we have our um, YCA Youth Conservation um, Alliance, no, what is it? <laughs> I'm not sure, um, of folks who um, are working a lot with youths and trying to do a lot of environmental, um, uh, um, uh, sorry, education programs with them, but it tends to be younger um, folks, but it does go up through high school. Um, and we have had programs where we're working with um, college folks who are kind of also coming back and um, doing programs with us. But we're not doing, you know, much more than exposing and sort of connecting people with nature. We're not doing those sort of training programs to give them those certifications or get to kind of what sounds like you guys might be doing a bit more. Do you know if like any of the groups working like the bland internal monitoring or any of the other monitoring programs of some of those restoration wildlife reintroduction work is going on? Is that being done primarily by like county staff or uh, I know the zoo is involved, the shed aquarium and others. And so I know that there are folks that are monitoring across the region. I just don't know what access for interns or youth or uh, entry-level positions are in that? I've seen a couple training sessions be offered. Um, so I think the Peggy Nobart Nature Museum, um, as well as, like you said, the, the, um, the whether it's botanic gardens or um, our zoos and, um, and aquarium system that are kind of leading some of that plant research, I'm sorry, animal research. Um, but they tend to offer, you know, once or twice a season, they'll offer like a new volunteer training um, course. Um, maybe that's something where, you know, looking at the time of day or the day of the week that they're offering them, if that's something that is, you know, uh, accessible to, you know, young professionals who are um, in the workforce, maybe they're working, you know, irregular hours uh, because they're in, you know, more of a, a flexible schedule because of, you know, they're, they are entry level. Um, so maybe they're working Saturday mornings at their job and aren't able to make these trainings. Uh, but then also, you know, offering those programs, not just at the start of the season when they most need them, but also opportunities throughout the season to, to join in and participate. Um, I remember a few years ago, I uh, took a class, I learned how to sail at the local uh, Crystal Lake Park District. And I was really excited. I did it right around my birthday in August. And then they're like, okay, well you have this weekend and next weekend and then we're closed for the year. And I was like, oh, well, I just did the train. I, I got all excited and now it's done. But um, that made me even more excited in the spring to, to get out there and get back on the boat. So, you know, even though it seems like, you know, for the organization, it might be like, well, you know, we're investing this training for what? Um, I think it is kind of like, and building up the anticipation for the next year, perhaps. Um, but that's a good idea to um, Laura to talk to group, whether it's the um, AZA, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. It's kind of like a national um, organization, or to you know nature, uh, you know 
botanic garden organizations or or like ArbNet and see what monitoring might look like and if we can integrate some examples or, or models of that. Sorry for tuning in and out. Um, definitely want to open C4 as an opportunity to leverage these conversations. Uh, and, and even if you're interested in the first person to start some of these trainings, um, like I feel like the series opportunity with all these different angles or, you know, GIS, um, asset mapping, uh, tree inventory, like each component is very crucial to our overall, you know, success and longevity. Um, so if we could do like series and, you know, gradually, continually or gradually and continually introduce them to communities, hopefully we are eventually building up that workspace. Um, I know the hope for 2024 is to have a public engagement solely around green landscape technology, but that doesn't mean that that's all that we're going to talk about there, right? You know, we're going to talk about all these other things that couple with it. Okay, now we're talking about conservation, environmentalism, and long-term sustainability. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I think that's something that we're going to have to, you know, as we build up this curriculum, um, I hope to, you know, we're going to, we want to have some of these you know, deep, um, you know, investment in whether, like you said, like a three week to a, even a year program um, for, you know, really deep investment in this work. But also, um, we know we can't train all the people and offer this program with the um, number of seats as well as the frequency and the locations needed to make it accessible to all, um, you know, kind of this global audience. So while, um, where we hope this curriculum will go is, you know, launching maybe in five cities or something throughout a region, which is not a lot when you think about, okay, all of Latin America and Caribbean, we're going to have like five cities with what, 10 to 30 slots. That's not enough to meet the growing need. You know, if we're only doing this, you know, one time throughout the decade. Um, our hope is that, you know, one, we get some um, additional funding and are able to do it annually in those cities as well. So once we've kind of done that pilot for that, you know, for that region, we're able to continue it along through the rest of the decade. But also to Winton's point, um, that we can offer like mini series that are virtual, um, you know, where you're getting the, tr the, the classroom training part, maybe you're not able to, you know, have a chainsaw in front of you. Okay, you know, do this at home along with us, start up your chainsaw. Um, maybe, maybe not a great idea. But I'm um, talking through, okay, here's the PPE that you need to operate this equipment. Or here um, is where you can find additional resources on this and go to your local forest preserve to a volunteer workday or see if they have a chainsaw training class that you can participate in locally. But for now, here's kind of the classroom part as a mini series. So I love that idea and making sure that we we increase access to this so that the curriculum isn't, you know, all this work, all this consultation to get to, you know, a couple hundred people who end up participating in that. And also because this will be a global curriculum, it will be translated as well to additional languages. And so we can offer it in the Chicagoland community in English and Spanish, for example, um, if that is a need that we, um, if that we, that we see in our community. And so, <coughs> Um, that's another opportunity for growing the um, potential communities that are engaged in this work. Um, Laura, if you don't mind sharing the last group of um, the last group of questions is just on resources, and you know we've kind of been talking about some of these resources as well, but um, similar programs that you've seen, what kind of sets the programs apart that are successful? What do they do? What part of their program, do they do so well that it really keeps people coming back and makes, um, you know, organizations like the ones that each of you work at um, wanting to invest and send your uh, potential employees or your volunteers to those trainings? Um, what resources should we be seeing? Um, you know, is there a, a book or a or um, a piece of literature that you're like, this is like a pivotal text that needs to be included, whether just for the, you know, tall grass prairie ecosystems or for a global audience. I think uh, most people who studied environmental science 
um, read um, Tragedy of the Commons by Garrett Hardwin. Um, and while there are definitely some issues with with his work and in the you know the perspective listed there, you know, from a lot of the white conservation um, leaders of you know of the past kind of century and uh, or well two centuries of um, restoration land preservation efforts in the United States. Um, that was kind of a key text that we all read and starting to understand the loss of public spaces and public goods. Um, and so what are some of the texts or resources that we should be including um, that you'd like to see? And these can be things that, you know, after the session today, if you're like, I, I know there's a book, I can't remember the title of it, it's sitting on my, you know, on my bookshelf at home. If you think of it, send it to me. I think I have my contact information at the end of the presentation and I can share my screen again for that part. Um, but yeah, is there, what are things that you're thinking um, would be helpful if you look at those questions on the sidebar? Definitely not an expert, but um, you know, I always raise the point of mentorship. Um, you know, it's, it's the part that probably takes the most energy and intentionality and creates the most value, but you can never ascertain whether that whether you're going to get that return on investment. Um, but I say the return on investment should be to the world and to society anyway. Um, so we should always be incorporating that, you know, as a very high priority because some folks they'll learn these skills. And they'll be like, oh, okay, I can just go do this. Where if you have, you know, that truly um, ingrained and invested mentor, they'll they'll teach you all the roadmaps and all the pathways um, and, and just bring you in incrementally so that folks can grow at their own pace and not necessarily um, according to their appetite or desire. Um, that's the yeah. main one that I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we definitely have uh, hope to incorporate a mentorship program. So maybe after graduating program, or kind of during the three weeks, you're introduced to some potential mentors, and then making sure that there's follow up so that, you know, after the program concludes, there's there's someone helping you guide, where do I go from here? How do I take this knowledge that, you know, I was just so deeply invested in, and bring it into the real world? I'm going to share my screen again so we can see. Oh, watch. So, who's the target audience again in this whole effort? Yeah. So the target audience is, um, you know, very broadly young people, so under 35, who are unemployed or underemployed, who want to seek a career in ecosystem restoration. So really broad. Um, our hope is that this, um, and actually, if I click through, I might have some additional, oh, here we go. So this is kind of the process that we hope to undergo um, with this. So, you know, once we have the curriculum kind of developed and, and resources available, at least in one to two languages, uh, we're going to connect with uh, communities on the ground. So, you know, that's where I mentioned, like, we'd love to partner with Morton Arboretum. We, again, we don't want to just, you know, come into a place and set up a nonprofit and say, we're going to do the environmental education here. We want to partner with the existing environmental educators and provide them with additional resources um, both through funding as well as kind of a an established curriculum that's been you know kind of peer reviewed um, that meets the need of a wide audience. Then we're going to work with them on making this curriculum locally um, relevant, so adapting trainings to match the geopolitical or ecological context. Um, a few years ago, I offered a training on you know how to connect with your legislators about 
a um, and, and do like environmental um, policy advocacy. Well, it doesn't work if you're not in a democratic country, right? And so offering that program to people who are based in in China or um, UAE, you know, it didn't make sense to them. It was like, I, I can't, what do you mean? Talk to my legislator. Like, I can't, you know, I, uh, that's not an option for me that, you know, they don't respond to public input necessarily in the same way they do in the United States. And so making sure that we're taking those things into account, whether it's targeting specific ecotypes or, or value systems, you know, religious, um, you know, uh, religious beliefs and saying, okay, majority of this region is Muslim. How can we integrate some of the, just the language around their faith to um, make some of these conversations more relevant to what they've grown up with. And then selecting local guest speakers who have that leadership. Then we're gonna run the program uh, making it, I don't know what D9212 is, but um, making it free for young people involved. Um, and then, you know, and again, looking at this as whether it's a virtual program or an on the ground program, we're still trying to figure out what that looks like from a funding position, uh, position because if we're having people travel from Indiana and Iowa or something like that to come to a Midwest training, or we only have one train in the entire United States, you know, how do we make that um, something accessible for more people? And then we've got the mentorship and follow up. And then finally, um, we want people who are going through this program to develop some sort of a project or, or um, thing that they want to work on. It could be, you know, something as small as I want to work on my resume and get a job and, and try this out, or it might be, I'm going to go back to school in the fall and I'm going to make my research paper about this work. Um, it might be, you know, I'm starting a new company that's going to do ecological restoration. And so helping them to achieve those goals, whether through the mentorship or uh, potentially micro grants. You know, all of this is very conceptual because we don't have, you know, a million dollars to implement this program over the next seven years like I would like to. If you have a million dollars sitting around and would like to donate to this cause, please let me know. Um, but yeah, that's just not uh, something that we have, you know, available. And so looking at uh, making this cost effective for different organizations to be able to host this, not just someone who has the, you know, um, the endowment to be able to support um, a, you know, $300,000 initiative or conference. Um, so going back a little bit, somewhere in here, I had, um, you know, my contact, a little bit about my contact information, how you can reach us um, if you, um, so this UN Decade YTF um, goes to myself and some of the other youth. And then I can also drop in the chat my personal email address, um, and we do have a um, Google Forms uh, consultation as well, if you'd like to kind of put more inputs there. So here's all the contact info. So, oh, sorry, email did not come through as a link like it was supposed to. Um, but this mailing list and WhatsApp groups, um, definitely a word, word of caution if you want to join those. Those are um, you know, dedicated to, to youth or young people to participate. And it can be, you know, a lot of communication. So um, yeah, definitely feel free to unsubscribe if that's not what you're looking for or, um, or you know, have a conversation with me first about ways to get involved instead of just joining, you know, the 400 people on our mailing list that we have uh, globally. Um, but really what we want to do, what, what's going to happen next is I took some notes during the session. We have a couple whiteboard slides as well um, and the chat that I'm going to take after this uh, and kind of put into a, a summary of what we discussed today and what are some of those barriers and opportunities for um, workforce development in the Chicagoland region. I'm going to submit that to, um, to be combined with all the other consultations that are being hosted around the world um, and then we're going to build that into and incorporate those into our curriculum design so that we're making sure that the, the design of the program is um, adaptable to local needs while still offering consistency throughout um, the program so that um, because we are actually 
looking to even partner with the university to accredit this program so that you can get, you know, kind of like a graduate certificate or something similar um, for the work um, or for completing this program. So there's still a lot to be uh, figured out of how we do this. But lastly, I just want to um, share this slide about how you can create a cafe if you want to um, host a conversation. Um, uh, typically an hour, oops, I went a little bit, you know, I know this one was scheduled for two hours, um, but definitely reach out to Laura if you're interested in um, hosting your own cafe about a different topic. And then again, just appreciate the support of the sponsors behind this program, the Illinois Na uh, Department of Natural Resources, and urban and community forest program from USDA. So thank you so much for joining. Um, yes, please feel free to reach out or, you know, I can stay on this call, you know, a couple more minutes as well. If anyone has last things that they just want to blurt out, I'm so thankful for all of you for participating in this program and just engaging um, in such meaningful ways. So these were great conversations. Let's keep them going. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I will, I will upload this and the recording to our website and it, the links will be in there so people can contact you um, via your email or or get directly in touch so thank you very much everybody Thanks so much. all right bye-bye have a great day take care thanks so much laura i yeah, thanks Sarah. we're gonna work on the uh on the whiteboard thing i, I think. know i have to figure that out i'm so sorry we'll let's yeah, we'll work on that also but Wait, me, why, why did, I think it, I, it's oh. Zoom's fault, not yours, for sure. Like, why do they design it so that it doesn't save? I don't know.